Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Scott Belsky. All right. Welcome back, everyone. How's everyone feeling this morning? Good? All right. <laughs> We hope you're having a great time at Max. Uh, and it sounds like there are amazing things going on over at the uh, community pavilion. I took a, took a look and was pretty amazed. Also, speaking of community, behind me, this is a great piece of work by Eric Johansson, one of the early Behance members, who actually spoke, I believe, last year at Max. So thank you to Eric. Um, we hope you're enjoying the new Fuji camera. Any? Yeah. All right. Good. <laughs> great. Uh, so, uh, and we'd like to thank all of our Max sponsors who are making this a great event. So, a quick round of applause for our Max sponsors. <laughs> so, I, I also want to take a quick moment uh, to recognize all of my colleagues here from Adobe. You know, these are the passionate designers and engineers. I sit in a lot of meetings with these people uh, who, you know, argue on behalf of your interests, of your frustrations always advocating for the customer. And, and you know, these are the people that listen, envision, and execute, often despite the odds. So to all my colleagues at Adobe, if you don't mind ri rising for a quick moment to be recognized. Where are you? There you are. Uh, so yesterday was a big day. Uh, we shared a lot about what our teams are doing uh, with Creative Sync and connecting apps and assets with mobile and desktop, really just trying to get everything out of the way for your creation uh, to be the center point, uh, helping you express yourself in new ways you know, with less friction, and making your crea creative process more productive. So yes, you know, new technology is always really exciting to see. I think we have more sneaks later. But today we're going to, or this morning rather, we're going to switch it up. And we're going to put the spotlight on all of us, the creative community. Today, Adobe steps into the role of curator, bringing a selection of ideas and realizations and lessons learned to the main stage from creative minds that we admire. And we get to see, of course, you know, a lot of their amazing work. Today is really the, kind of the heart and soul of, of Max. Uh, while creative tools help us express our ideas, they are not the source of our creativity. Creativity comes from our genuine interests, you know, our initiative, and what we see around us, the collective. In some ways, I like to say that creativity is the world's greatest recycling program. Uh, we get inspired by what we see, you know, and then we create what inspires others. We are both contributors and we are beneficiaries. Where we're not just creating for ourselves, and we're not even just creating for our customers. We are creating the building blocks that others will use to create. We chose today's speakers because they represent what it means to push the boundaries of creativity through their work. And as a result, they are making a significant impact across creative industries and largely on society. They are progressive, and they represent the type of work that so many of us do across different creative fields. Photography, art, design, illustration, writing, and cinema, to name a few. But regardless of your field of work, their journeys on how they got to where they are today should resonate with all of us. They are contributing to the collective in remarkable ways. So I encourage you to sit back, uh, hear their stories, and listen for the gems, and, and really enjoy. We had fun putting this together for you. Our first speaker today is Myra Kalman. Myra is the definition of what it means to push boundaries. You simply cannot confine her to a title. She is a writer, author, illustrator, artist, uh, even the occasional songwriter. She began her career as a writer, but realized along the way that she could combine all of her passions to produce some incredible, incredible work. Her memories, instincts, and this sense of humor that she has inform each of her projects and affect her creativity in impactful ways. Myra has some powerful universal lessons about how to humanize our work by applying our creativity to many different fields. Please join me in welcoming Myra Kalman. Welcome. Thanks, Scott. Good to be here. Thank you very much. I made that movie that you saw in the beginning. I just put that together. Usually I illustrate, but I thought I would try something new. So, um, 
Well, here we are talking about creativity, and I thought that I would start, as I always do, every talk I give, uh, to show you uh, this uh, image of my mother. I start with my mother because she was an extremely unusual, irreverent woman, full of humor, uh, and, and um, inspired me a great deal. So I was doing a year's worth of online essays about American democracy and history for the New York Times. And at a certain point, I asked people to sit down and draw a map of the United States. Just sit down and do it by memory. And I think that most of you, if I gave you that assignment now, you would probably do it, you would all get it wrong. I think maybe there are a few really brilliant people here who might get it right. But basically, it's a very difficult country to, to depict accurately. And so, but you would give it your best shot. Well, what my mother's map, by far, of all the, the many, many dozens that I received, was the most inspiring and the most interesting. <clears throat> so, this is her version of the United States. Texas and California underneath Canada. Um, Hawaii's on the East Coast, Alaska's on the West Coast. She put in uh, the South Carolina is on top of North Carolina. And, of course, we're not even talking about the egg shape, and the, but you got Canada right, so that's quite amazing. But geography wasn't like the strong suit in our family. Actually, no information was the strong suit in our family, and I think that that really is a, an extremely important part of my life, because through the, through the middle of the map, she says, sorry, the rest unknown, thank you, which means, sorry, the rest unknown, I couldn't care less, you could all go to hell. And, <laughs> and, that's what, and that was the upbringing in the house, which was we adored culture, but it wasn't about uh, obtaining knowledge. It wasn't about performing. It wasn't about showing how you learn something. It was about being completely yourself. And I think that, that if that's the biggest lesson about creativity is that the only way you're going to find your own creativity, whatever that is, is to actually find out who you are and be yourself. Because nobody can duplicate you, your specific idiosyncrasies, your, your loves, your hates. So I think that that is a, an inspirational way to look at things, and, and I don't have to go very far, I have my mother to show me. So in, in speaking of creativity and, and the response to things, here's another map that I did in collaboration with Rick Meyerowitz, and we did that right after 9-11. It was a New Yorker cover that spoke of the shock and the grief of 9-11, the uh, confusion about all the tribalism that had somehow uh, exploded on our scene, literally exploded on our scene, and we were decided that we would, uh, we didn't decide actually, we just started talking to each other about all of these amazing tribes, and we said, well, New York is really tribal, and so we came up with uh, making tribes of New York. I don't know if you can see it, but um, we broke up New York into, so, you know, Queens is, I think, no, that's Brooklyn, Fatushis and Kandabar. Uh, there were the mullahs, there was easy Pashtuns, and in, in Connecticut there were the khakis and the car keys. And I think that what happened was that we were able to take something that was absolutely tragic and world-changing and allow, to allow ourselves to turn it around and to, and to have a sense of humor about the notion that life is fragile, that horrible things will happen to everyone. And the only way you can survive, from my point of view, is to be hopeful, even though, you know, you have despair, and it's like Beckett said, I can't go on, I'll go on, that you have to have a certain sense of optimism in the face of all that madness and a sense of humor. So that really informs all the work that I do. And I don't know whether you have to be born with a sense of humor or have a family where you're forced to because things are so grim. I really don't know what the story is. But uh, I spend <clears throat> the beginning of each day with a cup of coffee, reading the obituaries. And again, that puts a beautiful spin on the day. It kind of <laughs> makes you appreciate the fact, well, here I am having a cup of coffee, I am alive. And if, if you're ever wondering philosophically what the meaning of life is, you can say, the meaning of life is having a cup of coffee and being alive, and that's probably it. So you don't have to go any further. All religion, forget it. So uh, my sense of the day is that time is fleeting, time is fleeting, Time is limited, uh, and you don't know what's going to happen to you, so you really have to make important decisions. You're going to make the wrong decisions along the way, but for me, time is the most important thing, and what you do with your time. So, 
I decided a long time ago when I, when I, I as uh, Scott said, I wanted to be a writer, and then I realized that there were so many words, I couldn't handle them all, and I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could tell my story with illustrations? And then understanding that writing and, my, and painting could be combined, and my husband and I started a design company, so design and writing and painting was a wonderful thing, and I thought, my job is to walk around, to wander around in a kind of stupor, with an empty brain in the best sense of the word. You know, I'm very proud of the empty brain. And just show you what I fall in love with and then collect that information and give it back to you. So, <clears throat> brings me to the boiled chicken. The boiled chicken is one of my great, I don't know how you feel about this image, but I think it's one of the great images of my life. Uh, <clears throat> So it's, uh, I was in Rome and I went to Florence for the day and I was wandering around all the great art, but the only photo that I took was of this boiled chicken uh, that I had for lunch uh, with the feather still in the leg. And I thought, this is an incredible chicken and the incredible spareness of the plate and the knife and the fork. It was one of those ecstatic moments, and even though it might not seem that way to you, and I thought, this is what I do. I collect ecstatic moments throughout the day that infuse some kind of sense of passion and love, really. So, uh, I, in the wandering, I wander and I see... If you, now, if you take a look, you'll see that there are many, many sofas on the street. I photograph every sofa that I see, and I have hundreds and hundreds of photographs of discarded sofas. Uh, I used to take them home, but now I know better. And the... the <laughs> I, you know, I also collect photographs of broken things because the sense of something broken is really thrilling. And when you think about you know, people and how vulnerable we all are, to, to be allowed to be broken and to go on with that kind of information is really wonderful. So I have a lot of... Um, I have many paintings of sofas that, are, that I, I'm very fond of. And then, of course, there are people. And I wander around and I, and I follow people. And this is a man in a park in Moscow uh, who didn't want me to, to photograph him, but I kept running after him, and he kept running away, and I kept running after him. And finally, I got him, and I was wondering, I mean, I think that his suitcase probably just had, you know, his briefcase probably had a lot of sandwiches in it, and I think, you know, that I, I would, I, the only people that I ever approach are people who I really do find an affinity with. It's never anything about mocking or any a kind of um, sarcasm. For me, it's about saying that, well, really, we're all in this together, and, but some people just look better, and some people have better fashion, so I, you know, I tend to photograph them. And then, of course, they become, unbeknownst to this man, he's, he, he's been in a number of images that I've used, and this one is with a, a quote of Einstein that I did for a project. Uh, the only reason for time is that uh, not everything, ha everything doesn't happen at once because that would be incredibly confusing. So now I've walked through the day, it's time for another cup of coffee. Uh, you know, ass assignments come into me, I, I work, uh, you know, the phone rings and some wonderful assignment comes, and the serendipity of that is really delightful. So I'm surprised all the time. And in this series of American history, I did a piece about Lincoln. And of course, Anybody who, anybody who does anything knows that Lincoln, you know, you fall madly in love with Lincoln. And I really, really fell madly in love. And I went to Springfield and I went to the Rosenbach Library and did research. But the best piece of, piece of information that came out of this was this piece. And I decided that clearly, Mrs. Myra Lincoln, a request the pleasure of your company at the Sunday Social was the most important piece of information that I thought I would be a much better wife to Lincoln than Mary Todd. I mean, I know that they had, a, I, I think that they were okay together, though they had a really horrible, horrible time, but, and everybody says she was crazy, but I really felt that if, if I had met him, there's a time glitch, there's a little bit of a problem there, but basically if I had met him, that he would have been, he, he and I would have been a perfect couple. So the, the sense of, I'm able to put this piece in, in you know, I, to put this um, crazy little invitation to a, you know, to a social uh, in a piece of the New York Times uh, allows me to digress. And I think that the, the, point, the point of everything is to digress, which is uh, always wonderful to know. Uh, don't, you know, that's a good lesson to learn. Uh, another year of online columns that I did for the New York Times, illustrated essays I did for the Times, was really about that, about me wandering around and digressing. It was called The Principles of Uncertainty. 
And I started with different stories. Uh, this was the month of February, which is a really grim month for those of you in New York and other parts of the country. Uh, February is not the nicest month. So I was able to t tell stories about what happened to me that month. So there was a man who was dancing on salt, and then somebody sent me a package, and the package was wrapped with a newspaper. The newspaper had a photo on it of a man who was lying in the snow. And I hoped that the man was not dead, but the man was dead. He was actually dead, lying in the snow. And it turned out that the dead man in the snow was this extraordinary writer named Robert Walser, who had spent the last 25 years of his life in a mental institution and was allowed to go out on walks once in a while. And on this final walk of his, he fell down and he died. Um, the end. No, so I'll go on after that. So, uh, his books are really extraordinary, and they also speak of something that's really important to me, and one of the books he wrote was called The Walk. And walking is a very important part of my life. It's, it's something that I couldn't do without, and it informs a lot of how I feel about things. But I go on in this column to talk about lying and about how, how is it possible that we actually form sentences with each other and we actually can talk to each other. And my mother once said to me that if everybody said what they were thinking, nobody would be speaking to anybody, which is really <laughs> kind of a sad thing to think. So, but maybe it's true. And then I run into this incredible looking monk on the street wearing this fantastic robe. And he invites me to come to a tea ceremony at the Inner Peace in the Inner Peace Center, but I'm quite sure that at the Inner Peace Center he's going to chop me up into little pieces so I don't go. And then I end this piece with um, talking about how my parents had a very difficult relationship. They didn't really speak to each other very much, but they had a lot of parties, which is very confusing to begin with. But at these parties in Riverdale in the Bronx, which is where we lived, they served mocha cream cake. So at the, so at the end of this year-long uh, series of, of articles. It was published as a book, The Principles of Uncertainty. And Nico Muley, who is an extraordinary composer who I've worked with before, uh, created a song cycle based on the text of this. And at the end, after the, after the performance, we came out into the hall and everybody had the 30 mocha cream cakes from uh, Mother's Bakery in Riverdale, which to me seems like the only fitting way. We should be serving cake here at the end of this thing, but we're not. I could be serving you cake. I would be. So, um, some, sometimes things that are incredibly delightful happen, and you have to be open to them. So, uh, this is a little bit of a story about Tuscanini's pants. <clears throat> My family came from Belarus. They left in 1933. They took the SS Polonia to what was then Palestine, which is what is now Israel. Tel Aviv was an incredible city, uh, Bauhaus architecture, modernism, uh, trying to establish a new way of creating life in a new city. At the same time, in 1933, Bronislaw Huberman, a Polish violinist, is understanding that the future is going to be very, very grim for the Jews in Eastern Europe, and starts to bring musicians to come and form um, an orchestra in Palestine. And he invites Arturo Toscanini, who was the most famous conductor in the world at the time, to come. Toscanini is now, and there he is with Gatti Casaza, who is his manager, and I just love saying that name, but Toscanini was now becoming an anti-fascist. He was standing up to Mussolini. He, w he told Hitler he, would not, he wouldn't perform in Germany. So he was getting into trouble, and it was an extremely fraught time, obviously, in history. So when Huberman invited Toscanini to, to conduct the first performance of the orchestra, he said yes. He came to Tel Aviv. There they are on the, um, on the esplanade of the, of the boardwalk in Tel Aviv. And the performance was a huge, huge success. Really, the world was looking at this performance, and it was an extraordinary thing. And Toscanini was wearing, as you see, that outfit. Okay. So in 1954, my family moves to New York, and here we are with our most beloved possession. We move to the Bronx, to Liebman's Deli, which is still there, and Mother's Bakery of the Mocha Cream Cakes, which is still there. Toscanini has to leave Europe at this point, and comes also to Riverdale, but lives in a slightly different house than we lived in. We lived at the Edmund Lee, he lived in this mansion, which is now Wave Hill. And, um, oh, I'm sorry. This is the, uh, the mansion in Wave Hill. I went to the High School of Music and Art and studied music. And 
Toscanini was an incredible presence in this place. And here uh, is the bust when we'd say we, we'd meet you at the Toscanini whenever we'd meet somebody. Okay, so one morning, Rick and I are having coffee and reading the obits and other things, and Rick says to me, they're auctioning Toscanini's pants in New York City. And I was out of there in two seconds, and I said, I have to get these pants. So I went to the auction house, and uh, the bidding was extraordinary. I was sure I wasn't going to get them. You might wonder how much I spent for them, but I won't tell you right now. They threw in the jacket. It was the suit that he wore to conduct the first, that performance, what well, they said, what well, we hope, that it was the suit that he wore to conduct the first performance of the Tel Aviv, the Israel Philharmonic, the Palestine Philharmonic. And I was said to myself, if I don't get these, I will lose, lose all hope, life will lose all meaning. But I did get them. And so, <laughs> I, but, you know, I didn't bring them, I didn't wear them today, I should have worn them today. But so I call them my anti-fascist pants and they hang in my living room on a ladder and they uh, remind me of many things, including the fact that uh, music is, is one of the most glorious things, that there may be the most glorious thing that we have. Um, but they're also very stylish and they are beautifully made. So speaking of style, The Elements of Style, which is the grammar book that many, many of you might know, written by Strunk and White, uh, is an extraordinary book. It's funny, it's eccentric, all the examples are really uh, inspiring and, and very nutty. So I, uh, you know, I studied literature in college, but I had never used the books because clearly I, something was amiss. I was spending more time in cafes writing tortured poetry than actually, uh, you know, than going to classes. So when I picked up a copy of The Elements of Style a few years ago and, and started reading it, I said, this is a book that I have to illustrate. And so the, the project appeared and it made so much sense. It took a few years for me to be able to do it, but finally I got the approvals and I was able to do it and able to create paintings that were um, illustrations of what, the, of what the phrases were. Because I didn't understand half the grammar anyway, but it didn't matter. Uh, it's really one of those moments where you say, um, th you know, this one, I don't know if you can read it, it says, he noticed a large stain right in the center of the rug. And, uh, you know, there are phrases like, Polly loves cake more than she loves me, or it was a unique egg beater. I mean, you're not going to run across these in any other, in any other books. Um, this one says, none of, us is, none of us is perfect. And there's my man from Moscow in the middle of that. And the sense of that, 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 you know, you're traveling around the world, you, you need fortitude, you need perseverance to keep going and to do the work that you have to do, which is probably the biggest lesson is that you need to persevere and not the non-quitting, if you want to put it in a kind of, you know, more ethereal way, the non-quitting is important. This is the last page of the book, it's the copyright page, and again, it was one of those examples of you don't have to take anything for granted, that there is no reason for a copyright page to be broken. To be, to be unbroken, to be, to be normal, to be boring. So I think that what you have to say is every brief that you get, every, every job that you get, are we asking the right questions? And, and how can it be informed with something that comes from your instinct and comes from your own, own sense of humor? So it's really important to do that. So there's another cup of coffee comes along the way. And then I'm on the terrace in Rome, my mother, and my mo when my mother died, I wanted to make a, um, a, an exhibit of her closet. So we opened an installation of her underwear closet in Manhattan on Cortland Alley. It's only going to be up for one more week. If any of you are in New York, you should come. And it's, she only wore white, and so it's this extraordinary piece of history and hope and you know, creating order out of chaos and, and, and the exalting of the mundane. And uh, along those lines, the same kind of installation that I did at the Cooper Hewitt, uh, where I took their archive and, and made a, an installation. And I speak about my family in Belarus, and I speak about my father falling out the window in a gray suit, but not dying, don't worry. And about a Coptic face from the 8th century that's very peevish. Beautiful hats. The Greatest Works, Winnie the Pooh and Alice in Wonderland. These are all things that are from the uh, collection of the Cooper Hewitt. And a painting of a photograph from Lewis Carroll. And a painting from uh, Cartier-Bresson and uh, Diane Arbus. 
And one of the best quotes in the world, which I used in the show, but I'm very poorly today and very stupid and hate everybody and everything. One lives only to make blunders. I am going to write a book for Murray on orchids, and today I hate them worse than anything. So farewell, and in a sweet frame of mind, I am. And so the sense that you can also be miserable, but you have to keep on going. Uh, my newest book is Beloved Dog, and it's coming out at the end of the month. And again, it's about walking around the city, walking around the world, collecting images of things that are uh, really vibrate to you, taking long walks, falling in love with dogs, talking about how I was sure that the dog, you know, this is the dog that, um, you know, that we were, grown, we were brought up to be afraid of dogs. So lovely dog will rip your face off for sure. But then I found that, of course, that that's not true. And that, well, it could be true, but it, wasn't, it didn't happen to me. And that the dogs that, I've, that I am madly in love with, including my dog, Pete, really inform life and, and, and uh, give you a sense of unconditional love that you, you wish you'd get from your family, but it's not always going to happen. Um, so I go back to Lincoln now to finish and say that uh, Lincoln also had a dog. His name was Fido, and I think he was cross-eyed. And in the ins installation at the Cooper Hewitt, I was able to borrow a watch that belonged to Lincoln from the Smithsonian. And what happened was that this watch, which hadn't worked for 150 years, was taken to uh, repair, uh, and it was cleaned and put together again and the made to tick for 10 minutes because it's so fragile and all the whale oil had been taken out and it was uh, filmed by the um, Smithsonian Channel. And then I was able to take the ticking of the watch to Nico Muley who composed a piece using lyrics that I had written. So what you're about to hear is something really extraordinary. It's the sound history of what Abraham Lincoln heard when he opened his watch. They don't know if this is the watch he had with him when he was assassinated because he had four. But it was made to tick last year, it'll, it'll, you know, and it'll never tick again. It never ticked before then. So we have this extraordinary opp opportunity to hear a piece about time. And we come back to time and say, what is the most precious thing? It's time. So uh, persevere in your time and uh, take advantage of your time, waste not a moment, as we say on the backs of our watches. And now we're going to hear the piece. Thank you. Bye-bye.